time for Wine Talks with Paul K. Fascinating story. This is Robert Mondavi from the Michael Mondavi Winery. I taste a lot of wine. Having a conversation with Shark Tank, Kevin O'Leary, Michael Silacci, Opus One Winery. Incredible conversation with Dr. Mia Ruth. No matter what, you're definitely going to feel better. Sit back and grab a glass. It's Wine Talks with Paul K. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are in studio today in beautiful Southern California, about to have a conversation with Emilio Morando of the Macario. Uh, what are you going to call it? Castello? Just Pico Macario Winery. Pico Most Macario States Winery in the Piemonte region of Italy. Introductions in just a minute. Wine Talks, of course, available on iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, wherever you hang out for podcasting. And always sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, now sporting the Rosé and Sweet series of wines. Hey, have a listen to a couple of Friulian winemakers I had in, in yesterday, actually. Um, and for you listeners, that would be probably a few weeks ago. It's um, a fascinating district of Italy. And we're going to talk about Italy today as well. But these two characters from this very small region of Italy had a lot to say about what's going on out there. Have a listen to those. But not while we're here today. Here I have a conversation with Emiliano Morando, who calls himself the export manager, the warehouse manager. What else do you do over there? Well, whatever they need. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be back to California after this, well, crazy period. Is this your we first trip through. back since? Uh, well, it's actually the second trip back. The first one, COVID. you know. Since COVID is the second is the second one, you know, and the first one business wise, it's, yeah. it's it's great to be back in one of the one of my favorite wine region in the world. So thank you very much wow, for hosting geez. us. Wow, yeah. that's saying a lot. Oh well, yeah, you know. type of guy. Uh, he, you're here for Trebecchi area. We talked about it a little bit yesterday, but Trebecchi area being, um, you know, the preeminent Italian wine show throughout the country. Uh, well, is this five locations, I think, or Well, four? exactly. They're going to be two. It's going to be today in Los Angeles, on Friday in uh, San Francisco, then Chicago and New York. Yeah, this is a kind of a habit for us to, yes. to come to the United States to this big show. We've been around here in the United States for uh, almost 25 years uh, with our Barberas and Nebbiolos. So it's for sure one of our... Under the, under the Macario more. family brand. Mm-hmm. Under the Macario family brand, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I was, we were talking yesterday with these Ferulians, and we were talking about this uh, Trebecchi area that was just three glasses in, in Italian. Right. And that here's this rating system, which is three glasses. You either got a one or two or three. Yeah. Um, and you, you think about some of the rating systems that are out there, the Spectator with 100 points and Robert Parker. And it's kind of like really um, – it's so simple. Nice three glasses, and that's it. You know, absolutely. You- it's like for us, it's like a small Bible. I mean, um, I don't trust hundred uh, percent. You know, the Bible of yeah, the right. wines. I mean, the <laughs> wine is is it is like talking about politics. You know, I like it. Yes. You don't like it. But you know, it's a good. It's a very good uh, Bible. Let's say guide that show that introduce uh, all the Italian viticulture and winemaking in the world. And it's getting very popular right now in 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 the world more and more. You know, like in Asia. In Europe has always been, has been you know very 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 important in the past twenty five years. Uh, but you know you need quality on the bag and you need you I need your final hand customer. I think what's like, interesting you know. about Trebek here, which is kind of different from the rest of them, like uh, <clears throat> Suckling will take in everything. They'll take in everything they want. They'll just rate it. And there's like right. I think I was I was talking to James Suckling uh, not too long ago at a tasting, and there's, he has six tasters, and we were talking about how do you get them on the same page? How do you how does the rating system work? You know, and I always talk about like you and I could agree or disagree on a wine there's no problem right but if I have a 95 point uh, Barolo versus a 95 point Bordeaux there it's completely different wines absolutely and so if I'm a shopper for 95 points I could be disappointed absolutely right absolutely and so it seems to me and I, and I know Mark Newman well he's a friend from way back who's one of the Trebecchieri uh, one of the big Gambaro Rosso tasters the, what's fascinating about this group is they start with something like what forty thousand wines? Sure, right. It's a lot, yeah. Right, that's a lot of tasting. That's a lot of tasting. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, my it whole takes, career is a hundred thousand, and this is it that takes took me thirty months, years. You know? <laughs> it takes twelve months. Yeah, and absolutely. so there's a rather um, explicit uh, you know methodology to filter the wines out, and you end up with the Trebek areas, and you come on, they go on the road and do the show. Yeah, but it's. Because it's focused on Italian wines only, I think it's absolutely. It's focused on Italian wines only, and it's focused on uh, on varietal. You yeah, know, like uh, like we are a Barbera specialist, and uh, most of the time, Gambaro Rosso doesn't doesn't 
give any award about for our Barbera. Nebbiolos because we we own like hundred hectares of Barbera oh, and for twelve. Your Nebbiolos. Yeah, wow. I mean, they always rate our Barbera more than our Nebbiolo because we are hundred Barbera. We have hundred hectares of Barbera and twelve of Nebbiolo, so we are dominant on the appellation of the Barbera di Asti. So most of the time, you know, the Gambra Rosso it's taking care of our Barbera more than our Nebbiolos. Does the know. world understand, uh, does the wine world understand Barbera and Nebbiolo if, generally? Great question. Uh, absolute, absolutely. The Nebbiolo has been, has been, uh, the crusade of the Nebbiolo happened, yeah, what, 35 right. years ago with the Barolo boys? Yes. So they opened the, the path for, you know, the Piemontese wines. Barbera is for sure, is the future in terms of, uh, of production in the area, either yeah. in the Alba area and in Asta district where we are. Uh, if they understand Italian wines, uh, you know, Nebbiolo and, and, and Barbera, yeah, sure, sure. We uh, just want to like, market. You know, yeah. let's, let's live the lay of land for the listeners. That, but we were yesterday, uh, the previous podcast they could listen to, we were on the absolute opposite side of, of the north of Italy yeah. in Friuli, <laughs> that's far east as you can go and so Piemonte is really probably as far west as you can go for a wine district absolutely yeah. okay so it's northwest northwest side. of Milan as well right yeah Milan it's about it's about an hour and a half yeah. driving from Milan uh, east I mean west towards uh, France so we're considered a little burgundy of, of Italy in terms of altitude 300 well, okay, 400 that makes meters sense. and I would say probably yeah <clears> the <throat> fact that there's such different terroir in such a short amount of time absolutely space actually absolutely you know absolutely elevation it's very important uh, the heat Yield is very low. That's why most of the uh, Piemontese producer they're not really looking into the biodynamic or the organic because the production is yeah. super low. So they don't really need to reduce their production because it's modern nature. It's is super. You know, it's it's very it's it's controlling very, it already. Controlling right? everything. You yeah. know, we're not talking about nothing against Puglia or you know the southern side of Italy where where the hill is sometimes free. In Piedmont, we are strictly regulated. And, yes. then, um, and then we have a, our own discipline, you know, about winemaking. So we're very, very uh, conscious and we take care of we take care of our vineyards. You know, most of our vineyards are between 25 and almost 70 years old. So, so we're, like if a, we're up there, we can, we can go to France in about an hour, right? Little Absolutely. Less. You know, yeah. you can reach the uh, Côte d'Azur, I mean, yeah, the French Riviera in an hour and a half. Isn't that time? amazing how different the... The cultures are just across the, uh, literally because I've well, gone from Monaco down into San Remo, which is just you know exactly. over the hill down the hill from. Well, Vermonte. in our time, we can be in Genova, we can be in one of the wow. most beautiful city of Italy, yeah. and then it can be in Milan, you can be in Switzerland, in Zurich in three and a half hours. So it's a very strategic that's area. Great. Great area. We like it, and four hours from Burgundy. You know, if we were to go back to the Burgundy. Wow, you could, that's true. I didn't even <laughs> think about that. You could just four hours from across Bone. the border there. Yeah. And Geneva's yeah. right above it. And that's exactly. okay. I didn't even think about that. That's pretty cool. Okay, you said something interesting though about the regulations because uh, you know we always talk about the, the new world and well, you're saying that Puglia in the south, which is the heel, of the boot. Um, right. There's no regulations as to what you no, can grow. No, don't get me wrong. They're regular. No, <laughs> don't they're, get me wrong. <clears> they, have, they have regulation. They have they have a control and guarantee appellation yeah, down do, there. Right? But of course, there is there is more there's more production. There is um, sometimes massive production and sometimes there's a free heel. So. It's all about the producer to reduce the quantity, uh, to reduce the yield, and and then go for an organic production, yeah, biodynamic. Right. So, and they're doing a lot down there, yeah. a lot, you know. Well, that it is. It was always known to be sort of the bulk uh, wine part of Cal of, of, so. of Italy. So now they have, and I think it's kind of interesting throughout the world. Actually, many of these districts where they that were considered large quantities are starting to refine themselves and produce absolutely. Themselves. The south of Italy, they've been they've been for a long time the lung. Yeah, right. Uh, I should not say this, but history nope. is on the book. Is is history is written? Down <laughs> hey, what, there, what are you gonna do? We gotta uh, say it the way it is, right? Exactly. <laughs> it is what it is. They've been they've been supplying you know for a long time, and then yeah. it was like a, a monopoly you know from certain other regions of Italy, and not only Italy. Yeah, I would go for France too. And, <laughs> That's true. Um, but you know the new generation, especially Sicily, especially in Puglia, they're doing uh, an amazing work in terms of quality, and and they, they were the one that helped to to increase the quality and and then and then the DOCG appellation came. You know even down there. I suppose that's kind of really even though this is old world, even though like geographically you would call these things old world, even though you would call the grapes old world, you probably even call some of the styles old world. But yeah. really, the idea 
of sort of the renaissance is really kind of a new world concept where we're sort of going to go in there and try new techniques and try to absolutely out- outperform our previous our ancestors totally agree and totally it's agree important that. i think for the wine world to do those things absolutely it was a great you know the old world would not exist in terms of quality right now without right. the new world right. the technology exactly. so. <laughs> yeah well that's why that's a good point california it's you know you've been pioneering a lot of things you know, well wine making wise well, you know We'll jump into that for a second because uh, there's a whole bunch to talk about. But and I've had this theory, and I brought I bring it up all the time now because I think it's something that hit me during a couple of of books I've been reading, and and the idea that uh, okay, let's just take Puglia. We'll take we'll take the, the contrast between Puglia and Piemonte. Piemonte is established. It's got more regulations. There's certain grapes. It's got a, a very defined regions of where the grapes can come from, you know. And then there's different levels of perceived of uh, complexity and, and interest in the wines based on that on that and then there's the history of Piemonte. there's this sort of generational influence i think that makes that really defines old world versus to me the new world in california we don't have this we're, mm-hmm. we, we're earning it but it's going to take another hundred years for us to look back and say what is the influence of these generations over the wines sure. certainly certainly knowledge of winemaking and family generations is sure. important, right? And so we're talking about, you're talking about 1930 something where these people- Yeah, are? exactly. Our family, the Macario family, they've been they've been in the uh, in the wine making uh, since, you know, the early 30s yeah. uh, with the grandfather. And it's it's one of a million histories. And I mean, we can talk about uh, Italian families that like my family, I grew up, my grand uncle was, it was a producer. So I was introducing the wine business not for a coincidence, you yeah, know. right. Yeah. We were all we all grew <laughs> yeah. up instead of with Coca Cola, we grew up with wine. You know, when yeah, we were, right. we were kids, <laughs> sipping, sipping on the rest of the wine, uh, sit, I mean, <clears throat> on a table, and uh, it's, it's it's a family. It's another f- an interesting yeah. and nice family story. Um, and, and prior and to thirty, about, what were they doing? Uh, they were they were farming. They were farming, you know, because we started with at the time with less than twenty hectares, and we reached in two thousand seventeen. 100 hectares of Barbera. Mm. So they were farming, they were selling the grapes. And then until the 50s, when they started to sell the grapes to cooperatives, there was a big boom of the cooperatives for a reason. You know, There was millions of small producer, and mm-hmm. they will not organize. Mm-hmm. They didn't have money for facility. They didn't have money you know, you know, know, for tractors here and there. So what they used to do, they used just to, they used to drop all their grapes to cooperatives. They were organized in a bigger facility. Sure. So we were one of those until those days, until the 50s, before we were farming uh, wheat and, 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 uh, and grapes, until, until the 50s when we started to increase and replanting uh, a lot. There's a lot of woods in our area. Yeah. So uh, it's, not about, it's not about a massive plantation of vineyards. There's a lot of woods and then vineyards and woods and vineyards. So we started to replant because of a lot of disease came during the sure, 70s, 80s, right. and 90s. So we started to replant a lot of the Barbera, very sensitive varietal, until, like I said, in 2017, that let's say we reached this worldwide record uh, of 100 hectares of contiguous and consecutive Barbera. Wow. That's, that's the that's great big. thing. It's a, it's a unique land. It's a, it's a single vineyard estate. So wow. we're not talking about a vineyard here and a vineyard no, 20 miles away. a single away. vineyard, contiguous land. That's pretty, pretty exactly. special, really. We got uh, the largest, not in terms of volume of production, not in terms of bottles, the largest single vineyard of Barbera di Asti, 54 consecutive and contiguous actors. Wow. So that helps to make quality at the end of the day. Right. Well, that's what I was going to bring up. Even, even the, It's almost like you can't, you shouldn't discount and you shouldn't uh, downplay the idea that, that so many f- families in the wine business throughout the world actually were farmers first. Yeah. They always are farmers. And since we always talk about the fact that, you know, what's in the bottle starts in the vineyard and it has to come from the vineyard, that's a very important piece of of generational history to understand. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. otherwise, you, and I think it's important to understand that wheat was growing there or that whatever other, you said hazelnut uh, trees were growing there. Right. Um, doesn't that influence the long haul of the nutrients of the soil and all the things that could, all the influence that could happen from that? Well, it's there, yeah, there's a big influence, you know, and uh, the point that we converted a lot, a lot of land to hazelnut trees, it's uh, it's because of a lot of little family they gave up. Yeah. They gave up with the, the wine, I mean, with the grape 
farming, I mean, with winemaking. They gave up and they said oh, the only thing to do that works well in the area, you know, is to plant hazelnuts right. trees. Well, you're making Nutella up there, right? Isn't that Absolutely. Where it's, it's, <laughs> Nutella is 25 <laughs> kilometers away from is it? Aero. It's, it's very close to us. I don't think people know that. That's where it, that's where it started. <laughs> yeah. With Michele Ferrero is for sure one of the... Uh, one of the bravest, uh, it's a brave, has been a brave man for, for the territory. Yeah, he right. helped to elevate the territory. Are there still co-ops there? Uh, well, yeah, this, he passed away some years ago, but they're still doing, yeah, they're still doing very, very well. I mean, well. The co are there still co-ops of wine? Oh, co-ops wine? Yeah, sure, sure. There's still like three, four major cooperatives. And even there, the quality has been increased dramatically. Yeah. Well, it should be. Well, being a wine farmer is hard. It's an hard yeah, work. Right. So the new generation, they're now on board. They're now farming. Uh, if they're small, they they prefer to go with a cooperative. And the cooperatives are increasing dramatically the quality. The The model that we're using in Piedmont in, for the cooperative is the model of the Sutirol. So uh, Alto Adige yeah. uh, cooperatives. Right, small, right. less than 200 members. So that means quality and small productions. I think it's it's kind of interesting because there's two different things. And the wine business is complicated enough that if you're a farmer and you're growing farms and you love the land and you're working the land and you're keeping you know, keeping it healthy and doing what you can to produce the best grapes, certainly a great alternative because once you decide you're going to make wine, <laughs> I mean, it's a now forget, forget the sort of the organic, I'm going to make wine and ferment my grapes and put them in a bottle. But then you got to market the thing, and this is not easy to do. And I think the listeners of the show understand that now because I talk about it a lot. You know, that's a whole different animal. It's a total different animal. That's why you're here in LA, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, we got to we got to work, we got to travel. You know, since the pandemic, we've been traveling less and less. You know, but still, you know, you have to be in connection with uh, with your people around the world. I have a lot of friends that they just started or they started 15 years ago to farm. Uh, and they like one man show, you know, and it's hard for them. And I, I talk with them every time, you know, they have to be in the winery. They have to be in the vineyards, taking care of the four season. They have to be in the market. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, the it's a challenge. And when I see these people present in their own market and then in the other side of the world, they said, chapeau, I mean, bravo, because I'm doing just one side. Yeah, right. You're doing one piece of it. Well, yeah, it's just a I, piece of it, you know, I've and had, it's incredible. I've had three different uh, gyms, like, you know, athletic gyms in my various places. And I've I've mentored a lot of uh, young men and women to train, to be personal trainers. I know this right. sounds like, a, where am I going with this? But I have to teach them, uh, look, if you're going to be training from three, five in the morning to nine in the morning, because that's before people go to work, right. and then you're going to be off until three o'clock in the afternoon, and then at three o'clock to nine o'clock, you're going to be training again. So what are you going to do? You, people are going to leave. So like you're saying this, if you're going to be planting the grapes, then you're going to do that at the right season, and then you're going to crush the grapes in October, and then you're going to wait for them to ferment, and then you're going to bottle them. Now from, you know, let's say December to to wherever they're just sitting in the tank, right, right, or they're sitting in a barrel, and now you've got all this time. And now you guess what? You're not resting. Right. You're going to go out and sell, gonna right? Sell. You got to go travel. You got to go take your wells to somebody else. You got to bring them to the Trebek area in Los Angeles and go try and do it. This is a tough road. Is a tough is a tough world. Is a tough work. It's uh, it's 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 a brave. For this small producer, it's brave. Yeah, unless you a, have a very well organized team, it's uh, it's a brave. Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about Piemonte and, and you know one of the great wine districts mm -hmm. of of Italy, Nebbiolo being you know the the grape of Lenghe and Barolo and, and uh, those wonderful wines, and then you've got Barbera, which you were saying when we were off camera that this is sort of the farmer's wine, the grape of the farmer. Totally what does that mean? right, Paul. Uh, he has been he has been for many years the wine of the farmer. Everyone, like I said, we grew up with with Barbera fields around us and. Uh, and as being a wine of the farmer, because everyone has a, a little piece of land in Barbera, so they yeah. were made, they were wine making at home, and so the wine has been for a long time unbalanced with high acidity, uh, you know, high, high alcohol, like 16, 17 percent, and it used to be bottling and like in a double liter bottle. I remember, <laughs> I, I mean, my grandfather wasn't, a, you know. Wasn't wasn't an alcoholist, but yeah, you know, right. it, it yeah. was drinking Barbera in a double liter because sure. it's, but it was 
awful. I remember that time. It was made at home, you know. It was like the wine of the farmer, like in Tuscany. They were used. What do you say, awful? Like you, it was awful, you know. Unbalanced, out of balance. acidity, you know. It it was, you know, for brave. And Only the yeah, brave. For the brave. Yeah, I like that word. That's great. <laughs> so until until a couple of great producers came on board and they. You know, just they just started with the U.S. market. They start to knock the door here in America, and and to understand that that wine, the wine, the wine needed to be made in a different way. So acidity, first first of all, acidity is one of the peculiarity of one of the character of the Barbera, like the tannins yeah, right. is for the Nebbiolo. So they started to work uh, a lot on the acidity uh, and on having a balance, you know, between acidity and alcohol. And, and then made it. It took forty years. Yeah, well, you know, forty years. This is a slow pro. This is a slow industry. I it mean. was made in a million different way. Believe me, uh, I'm from the '80s, and I had a chance when I was, you know, four, five, six years old to start to start to drink the the, the first Barbera instead of Coca Cola or milk, you know, and it was made in a million different ways. So there was no chance to to succeed. You know? Yeah, until like I said, a couple of producers came on board. And they start to make a regulation. And then from this two producer, an association of producer came. And then, you know, thanks to this reality in 2009, the Barbera became the OCG controlling guarantee, like the Barolo. Yeah. It, like I said, 2009, took, that's 2009, pretty recent. Yeah, it's pretty recent. That's if you think recent. about 96 to 6, Barolo and Barbaresco, yeah. you know, it took a, a good 40 years apart. But it's the future because um, Barolo and the Biolo is a squared wine yeah. you know it's a square square varietal you like it or not yes. you can it's a not it's not a crowd pleaser barbera can really please a lot of different palates hmm, not because it's made in a million different way but yeah. it, because it's very versatile it's just in our case as many other producer you know we can like you say you can we can have it in a rosé version in a friend in a um, traditional stainless steel so a lot of fruit fragrance and then, and then you can have the eye hand selection of Barbera. So large cask until if you want French oak. French oak was a big thing. It took a little, just a little coaxing. Uh, and I think, um, I think winemakers and wineries throughout the world, their job is to produce out of what they can. And now, what's interesting to me about wine in general, and this applies to to Barbera, is that it's always the, the character that you're now seeing has always been there, right? Absolutely. And it's our job you didn't to, know that. to figure that out and, to, and coax out of it so that people feel what it's supposed to be. Absolutely. But at the same time, I just thought of this, you know, for your grandfather, having that, you know, little, you know, an old fashioned site, not even out of a wine glass, probably, probably just a little tumbler, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. you know, having a glass of acidic wine. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because we, as you go into this, as you go into this, go through this as you and I are all these years. Acidity becomes a really important part of the structure of the wine, and so that we start to lean away from. And I think a lot of, you know, experienced palates would tell you, try to get away from too much fruit and get that structure and that balance between the acid, the sure. alcohol, and the fruit. Absolutely. In order for the wine to produce its best character, the Barbera varietal has all the papers in order. Um, it has the fruit. It has the tannins, if you want. It has all the herbal side. You know, it has all the spices. You mm -hmm. just have to, just have to wait. Yeah. The biggest mistake of my grandfather, of many other people, you know, that used to drink it immediately. So yeah. the acidity, <laughs> it was sky high. Well, I mean, it was yeah, crazy. Right, fourteen well, percent. They were thirsty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So like, like a fresh barbera, I need at least six months in the bottle. So. The bottle timing, the bottle refinement, th yeah. at the end is the best refinement for a wine. It doesn't matter if it's Sangiovese, Nebbiolo, or Barbera. The bottle time, the time in the bottle is the most important part of the refinement. So that's what we learned from day one, uh, with mistakes, of course. Of so. course. Are you seeing more worldwide acceptance then? Uh, let's talk about Asia and, mm -hmm. and rest of Europe and in other parts of the world like. well the well the the most historical market for us is europe there's no doubt the united states you guys you know the education even in the province like in the midwest you know is growing dramatically and so everybody's looking at barbera and the Biol grapes but the the asian market is responding very well like right. in southeast of asia i was in bangkok just in january I, I said, you know, really, this is a, a big beer distributor yeah. and it, it is looking into nebulos really? I thought that, you know, yeah, it's a beer country only. Yeah, right. It's like 35 degrees Celsius, best case scenario, is Bangkok. And 
now you can find some of the best wine of the world in some of the weird place in the world. So it's Thailand interesting that the, the, you said that I had I've had this conversation before with people, but the palates as a uh, individual, mm-hmm. we, we grow, right? Like when I got married, my wife only drank Gallo Rhine wine, and <laughs> now she's my biggest critic of you know all wines red. But it seems to be uh, sort of the the mode of most countries, and so the the large populations, their palates tend to move. And so yeah. you're talking about Asia where they were mixing Coke, and you're talking about Coke right. earlier, they're mixing Coke with wine, correct? And now, and then they went right into the, like the Napa cabs and the big Bordeaux. And now they start to look at wines like this where there's more acid and more structure, Absolutely. including Burgundy. And all of a sudden, it's just interesting to watch cultures educate themselves. Education, first of all, and palate develops, like you said. Yeah, you know, I think everybody so. started with the sweet, right? Right. Everybody yeah, Asia, that's true. Asia, America, even in Italy, we started with the sweet. I remember 15 years ago selling tons of Moscato to the United States. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, and if you think about the Barolo, Barolo itself, the, the Barolo boys came to the United States mm. with Barolos. 100% aged in a French oak, because that was the time of big Californian Right, yeah, that's what you did. You over- so it was it. the only way to show and to introduce Nebbiolo to the world. But without those people, without the Barolo boys, without- Who are the Barolo boys? I mean, Barolo just, boys was a big group of uh, the, 14, <laughs> 20 producers that I came in the okay. 90s to the United States to introduce, to introduce Nebbiolo. Wow, well, right. Yeah. The Cesare's of the world, Pio Cesare, stuff like that. Uh, well, there was uh, like Vietti, if I'm not wrong. There were Voerzio, some mm. of the biggest Barolo producer. But without that movement that introduced not a classic Barolo, but a modern version of Barolo. We were not, we would not be here talking about Barolo. You know, I was looking and, through my dad's archives. Uh, you know, we've my dad started in 1972, and his first four wines for the Wine of the Month Club were for, for Chablis, I believe, Grand Cru, as a matter of fact, for $6.29. <laughs> sure. So, <laughs> uh, but we, well, I went through because I had a couple of Italian uh, groups here th- last through COVID, actually, and I found that he featured a Barbera d'Asti in 1981. Wow. Yeah. And so that was it, a, early on, early, I think, for early, people early to, to know the wines. Yeah. But I, the comment I just made about the acid content, we were in Napa not too long ago. I was podcasting, and a woman, her name is Sharon Kazan Harris, and she makes wines called Rare Cat. She's probably the most bold woman in Napa because she pours Bordeaux in downtown Napa tasting room. Wow. <laughs> so who does that, right? <laughs> so, but the point is she sent home a bottle of Cab with me, a Napa Cab she had made, and I called her back. I said, wow, I know, this is a departure. This has got acid. Because so many people like the Camus and the Silver Oaks and these giant wines, they're gorgeous wines, and they certainly have their place in the wine world. But um, she was trying to prove that we could get a structure and acid out of a Napa Cab. And I... To me, that's growth. Right? Absolutely. Well, I had this kind of conversation about the oak uh, several times in the past months. Uh, without the French oak, without the 80s at the end of the day, yeah, right. without that transition time, we would, again, not be here. Because if you think about Italy, yeah. before the 80s, before the French oak came and everybody started to use the French oak and to have this modern style, mm-hmm. everybody... Every winery used to work with old barrels, gone. Hmm. I mean, exhausted barrels. Right. I remember they do my they just they soften. Yeah, they, yeah exactly. Them. And sometimes it was even you know barrels that ruined the wine. Yeah. So I was I was talking <laughs> with my grand uncle. We had this conversation. He was working in Tuscany with one of the major winery uh, in the eighties. And uh, it was one of the pioneers introducing Sangiovese and Brunello di Montalcino to the United States, uh, mm. aged in a, in a French oak. Mm-hmm. But he told me, you know, you know, at the minute before, everybody were using exhausted barrel here. Yeah. So we needed that period of transition. And then most of us, they're now, we're now back to the large cask, the use of the French oak, but with very conscious how we use it and how long we use it. So the French oak was really uh, uh, a starting point, you know, from zero. Let's I think start that's from part scratch. of what you're saying, though. It's a growth path. A growth path. That a you growth. have to sort of continue to massage. And I, yeah. Part of it, part of it, 
can be consumerism, but I kind of think that kind of that doesn't necessarily define what you're saying. You're talking about maximizing the value of the glass based on the the methods of fermentation and the methods of yeah. storing, so that the grape. And I think everybody that's that does this all the time, like we do, wants to taste the expression of the grape right. and where it's grown. And when you Absolutely. cover it with oak, exactly, you you kind of destroy it. But yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh, but we needed that that period. We needed uh, yeah, that, that 15 years that now people are interested to understand how how is the real one? Yeah. How is the real Barolo? How want I want to feel that super tight, you know, I want to feel right. that tannins, those aggressive tannin. Imagine a, you know, a traditional Barolo 30 years ago here in America. No, thank you. Yeah. It'd be fun to taste those again, huh? Well, yeah. Go back. And that most of these Barolo boys that were the modernists, yeah. they're now back using the large cask. Really? Like we do, we started like you know 25 years ago to use the French oak, and it was like 70 percent of our production of our aged wine were in French oak. Yeah. But now we're back to traditional classic large cask, so that's why we want to show because now our our you know our show our crowd is ready, ready to understand what we're talking about. So we don't need to hide ourselves or yeah, cover you know great. acidity or tannins. This is what it is. You know, you like it or not. We're in a, in a democracy. You know, you can drink whatever you, you can want. drink whatever you want. Exactly. That's they drink and some and in California, <laughs> California is also in that direction. You know, if you yeah. go up to you know Dry Creek area, you know, they're, they're losing. They're, they're using less and less French oak to show the beauty of the of the varietals. And almost everywhere in the world, I mean, there are still some. Ward, I mean, um, some big countries like uh, wine countries like Chile, you know, South America, that they they use massive oak, Argentina, but it's uh, they're they're gonna change. I'm sure that they're gonna change in the future. Well, they're learning their they're learning their lessons too, right? And so I suppose you you like all of humanity, you tend to repeat the disasters mm -hmm. of the previous generations because you think you know wow. better, correct? <laughs> and you know, right now, I think the trend in let's take Argentina, they're they're learning about Malbec at different altitudes, and so I think their legacy is going to be that. You know, it's not going to be the oak influence at the end when it's all said and done. It's going to be more of the altitude influence of the Andes exactly. that creates these different wines, and it's. The, the fact that you guys have arrived with Barbera and Nebbiolo uh, into, I'm not going to say a standardization, but at least now we're on track to ex that I can taste a Barolo, I can taste a Barbera d'Asti and so start to compare them because of the times. We've learned enough, we've, we've evolved enough, uh, the farmers have evolved, and now we're starting to get a stabilization of a character sure. and we can compare them properly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now it's kind we of can, interesting. We can we can finally show how the varietal is and how it shows up is natural. Natural. You said something interesting when we were tasting um, about and so much of this DOCs and 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 in, uh, AOCs in France mm -hmm. um, have sort of created a timeline that when we think about the old school. You kind of go, wow, you said 1966 mm -hmm. when the rules changed for Barolo. And the idea was that you brought up, and I'm sort of stumbling here, but the re what you brought up was you can create a labeled wine Barolo, which is a district, but you don't have to necessarily ferment it in Barolo, right? And that came about for some regulations that changed. You exactly. Said, um before 1966, all labels. I mean, when you when you used to when they buy when you buy a bottle of Barolo, it was Nebbiolo for Barolo, Nebbiolo for Barbaresco. Until 1966, when they decided to remove the word Nebbiolo from the label, and so it was just Barolo DOCG and Barbaresco DOCG. So the the appellation guarantee and control came that year for producers like us that we own. Before 1966, we own a piece of land in the Barolo and Barbaresco area. Mm -hmm. There is a specific license, let's say, that you are allowed to continue producing Barolo and Barbaresco even without the winery in the Barolo and Barbaresco area. Wow, that's interesting. So it's a, it's, it's a license given by uh, the Agriculture Ministry. Yeah, right. uh, we're just 16 or 18, and I should go back to my notes to check it out if I'm correct, allowed to produce Barolo and Barbaresco outside the DOCG area. So we're based 25 miles away from Barolo area, not a million miles. But still, <laughs> that, that gives us the opportunity to keep going with our historical roots since we own part of the vineyard. But the grapes still have to come from Barolo. Exactly. Yeah, so okay. the fermenting, winemaking, and bottling 
can be done outside. But if I want to, if I have a million euros or dollars to spend tomorrow and I go to Barolo and somebody sells to me a wine, a vine, I have to build a winery in the Barolo area. So it's going to be super expensive. You said two things that are really interesting to me. Um, one is they removed the varietal. Now, yep. at some point in, in the history of wine in California, which is not that old, uh, particularly the French, they love to put the varietal on the label because they think we're not too intelligent enough to figure out that it's not. Right. Like You just gave me an assist for like sucker, you know. <laughs> uh, but now They you... were super smart to remove the apple the, to remove the varietal from the label yeah because uh that that was the really the the, the the ground zero in terms of time uh for for the barolo i mean everybody started to say or well, what we're we talking about this barolo it's what this is sangiovese okay let me yeah right i want to i want to educate myself so and that helped to increase you know the territory visit so that happened for a reason. Mm -hmm. They wanted to focus on the Barolo village and on the Barbaresco village and on the territory without mentioning that that was Nebbiolo, you know. And that was, it was the secret of the success. We don't like to copy paste thing, but in Barbera, it yeah. happened in 2014 when the consortium of Barbera di Asti decided to remove the word Barbera from the label. Wow. And we put the name Nizza, N-I-Z-Z-A, that it's a little town, 12,000 people population in the Monferrato area, in the art of the Barbera. Huh. That is considered the art of the Barbera. Yeah, guest. right. So if you look at that label, in Nizza. this label, it's Nizza. The Barbera, Barbera word or Barbera di Asti statement, whatever you can call appellation, disappeared. So we started in 2014 to tr we're trying to replicate the success of the of the Barolo and Barbaresco with one of the most important varietal in Piedmont consider that Piedmont is over 50% of the land is barbera is not Nebbiolo. really that's Between surprising alba, to me it's a lot that's Between surprising. alba and asti yeah barbera so and we, alba right correct we decided in asti district to work on the territory first mm -hmm. on our territory in our district so all the barbera di asti unless they're fresh you know stainless steel only if they have if they see a little bit of oak the appellation the new appellation since 2014 is nizza we still have a long way to go i remember when the first time i submitted to the to the um to the ttb for the uh here in the united states yeah for registration right. you know label registration they said oh what the hell what is neat size not even in our file so we had i had to call a couple of other producers to when submit a that? label when was that it uh, the first time we introduced the was 2017 vintage okay so we i had the same problem hmm uh, yeah, we, we went to do something to register a brand and it said Neats on it and the TTB was not part of it. Was it was not in it there. It was on their list. And it was funny. After six That's times so we called them and uh, our importer compliance called them, we, we got the right person on the phone and he said, you know what? Let's put Nizza. We're going to register. But just on the back label, please, had made with Barbera grape. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it makes things easier. So we started together with another two producers to export the Nizza di OCG so funny. in the United States. And we know it's still a long way to go to let people understand what there is behind Nizza. But yeah. I want people that buy this bottle that here in California we're doing great uh, and just Google it and say, well, yeah. well, what is the Nizza di OCG? Oh, wow, this is a territory. It's a mm -hmm. little city. Mm -hmm. It's a little town in Monferrato. I've got, you know, next, next, next trip to... Next trip to Barolo area, I want to go to Asti too and and check it out what's going on there. We have well, some you know, beautiful producers. Those, the, the, today's technologies allow for that, right? So oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly looking up districts and it, it's funny that you brought this up because in my, in my database, every wine that I put in there and every district I put in there, it saves. And so when I go back to find a new wine that I'm putting in, I start to type the word and it pops up. Sure. And it's pretty rare these days after 100,000 wines that that... I've missed something, you know? You're doing a great but job. But once in a while, <laughs> you know, a grape comes up or a district like Nizza at the time, and I'm going, wait, I, I've never tasted a wine from Nizza before. Sure. But now with the apps like Wine Searcher and Picks.com, oh, you, you know, in a minute. There are a lot of people are, I, I can't tell you how many times I bring a wine to dinner at, at somewhere, and my friend will go take his phone out and he'll scan the sure. label and start talking about it. 
Sure. And that is huge for us in the industry. Absolutely, to it's huge. People. App is the is the new generation. I mean, yeah. generation using app also in the wine business. It's uh, in a way, it's it's good. In another way, as internet is, <laughs> yeah, it's no. uh, everybody knows the margin. Everybody knows the well, bar cup. Yeah. I gave up on that a long yeah, time ago. Exactly. I decided, look, <laughs> you know, look, I'm not here to break even, so people should know that. But you said something really fun, and I want to go back because I had a conversation with an Armenian winemaker years ago, and I asked her. I said, "Can you?" Can I, even in Armenia, which is a just a very young wine industry, I mean, not young, it's been around 6,000 years, right. but modern wine modern, making is really yeah. only 10 to 15 years old where there's palatable wines. Isn't that funny? You're talking about your grandfather and you know, he drank the stuff that you could probably drink today and, and not a, uh, maybe all wine districts in the world start that way because the Armenian wines, even in 2006 when I went there, were unpalatable. Right. And now they've, you know, took a little technology and some real winemaking know-how and they're, they're drinkable. But anyway, she said, I go, can you and I buy a winery or vineyard, plant it, and you know the cost of planting a vineyard, oh my. and make any money? And she's like, no. So I mean, you said a million euros, that hardly seems enough to try and start a winery in Piemonte, but it, how hard is that for you and it's I to do that? It's super hard. You know, uh, it's super hard. We're now facing uh, with the global warming. You know, I remember yeah. I remember talking about global warming when I was a kid. You know, when I was like a teenager, it was like something, oh, to fill your mouth. Global warming. Yeah, now, right. it's re- now it's Ooh. real. Now it's real. It's, true, yeah. it's there. It's out- outside out of door. You know, the drought is terrible. We haven't seen a drop of rain. So the risk of being, a, you know, an entrepreneur in the wine business yeah. today it's it's crazy, you know. And what, for, in Piemonte, is like I guess like California and Napa. Forget Napa. We the only people that are making money in Napa, and I say this sort of tongue in cheek, are the ones that <laughs> that have been around, you know, since the seventies, and the land's been paid for. Sure. But for you and I to buy land and plant it, no way. Do you know how many wineries gave up? And since two thousand and one, that's terrible date. But in Italy, two hundred and fifty thousand winery gave up. Gave what? up two hundred and fifty thousand wow. winery that's gave up huge. since that day. We just had a, you know, I just got this spreadsheet a few That's few amazing. Days ago. Throughout the whole country. Throughout the whole country, yeah. you know. And at, during those times, there were like a VIP person, like uh, actors. Uh, oh, yeah. We're... You know, <laughs> ministries, you know. They were, you know, the, the best thing subject. to do, the best thing to do is to buy a vineyard, you know, and make wine. Yeah, you know, hey, right. come on, the cake is this, you know. And since then, yeah, over 250,000 gave up. It is Risk. a romantic thing, you know. Well, that's what the everyday bring us on the street and yeah, bring us right. into winery. The passion, the romantic is always there. We need it's it. Like, We're driven by romance. People go to, I'm sure they drive, I'm sure Italians drive um, from wherever, What are, let's say they're, you know, it's always interesting to me when I look at a foreign country, like even France, which is a huge country and, you know, and I go to Paris and there's visitors from, from south, southern France or from Alsace or something, they're visiting Paris. I go, why are they visiting? But I'm like, just like me going to San Francisco, right? Yeah, it's just kind sure. of funny to look at that. But, you know, I'm sure they come to Piemonte mm. and they see the rolling hills and they have this romantic experience. And they go, I want to be in this business. And some try to do it. Yeah. And they realize how hard it is because A, it's really farming. And B, yeah. once you get out of the farming side and you try to bottle something and sell it, it's really hard. And extremely risky. You have to deal every day with Mother Nature. Yeah, it doesn't, that's right. doesn't yeah, give you, you a control. second chance. Yeah. And it's, it's you know, not the, easy. The global warming there, and we're almost running out of time already, um, but the global warming effect in Pamonte is it's starting dramatic, well into it. We're, we're changing the way we trellis. We're changing the way we canopy the grapes. Are we into that mode already? Well, yeah, it's been changing in the past 10 years. We haven't seen the right amount of s- snow. So, I mean, there's no water source. And it's a cycle. We know that. Yeah. We know that is a cycle. dumped on here. It's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you just, it was the same situation until a few days ago here in California. The drought mm-hmm. has been crazy here. So it's something that we have to deal with. Um, and uh, we have to understand, we have to respect you have, nature. Yeah, and that's, I think that's kind of what this, the value of, of, of um, experience is in our industry because you're going to go through these cycles. And this is like, I tell people, this is not a political show. I got in trouble for saying that from some listener. It's a, it's about the wine and it's about the culture of wine, but you know, global warming has something to do with it. It is happening. I think people understand that, you know, the, the reasons for that are up for argument, but it's happened for a long time. And this is the part that sort of guides my thought process and that, you know, there are parts of the world that, that, went through drought 
in the 1700s. There are parts of the world that went through a freeze in the 1700s. Correct. I was reading an article about 1940 vintage in Burgundy. Was there was frost in June. So this isn't new, really. It's and it's part of the sort of this humanity that our generation sees it for the first time, right. and we think it's new, but it's really not that new. It's not that new. Um, our generation, my generation, your generation, uh, we have been we've been going through. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of, of things, stuff. a lot of stuff. We we haven't seen the war, but you know, yeah. it's a kind it's a kind of war. You know, we were gonna talk about the current situation, and and, and one of the daily you know problems is, is 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 dealing with with nature that we still have to respect. Right. So, uh, we like to we like to be very sensitive. Uh, that's why we go for solar panel. We like to go with natural uh, water sources. So we're mm -hmm. trying to collect and to respect, collect water when we can from the little rain we got. So we want to respect as much as we can modern nature, even without a uh, certification of being yeah, organic right. or biodynamic, you know. Yeah, we didn't get to that. And I, I, want, I do want to touch on it while we got a few more minutes. Um, yeah. and I, the, the, the reason I wanted to probably was that when I asked the question, and I don't ask the question as a leading question to, to know, I just it's just interesting to know because I don't think, I think that you probably want as little intervention as you can. You probably want to produce the best product you can. You want to make sure that it expresses the territory and the, the terroir and the, and, the, uh, and the grape. So you're not going in there deliberately doctoring up the wines like right. many other s s supermarket wines are like sure uh, so so being organic or biodynamic for me is here nor there in the sense of you're you're already an honest mm -hmm. what i call honest wine right you're producing the best you Have, can from the soil well exactly that's yeah. what we do uh following the rules of just you know just the appellation for us it's it's enough and for many other producer you know the yield the heel that we have tells everything. Yeah. So then, of course, not using pesticides, you know, solar panel, all, I mean, 100% green, right. no emission. Um, you know, we fer fertilizer, natural fertilizer, yeah. that's what we right. do. Uh, we grew like uh, beans every other row. Yeah. Um, so. But again, I'm, I'm not willing to pay 35,000, 35 grand just for getting a certification. Right. I agree you know, with that. Uh, I totally agree with that. You, you, we go, we go B. That's, there's a new, there's a new logo that we're going to have on our back label. It's a B. Yeah, right. Uh, it's a European thing. Yes, uh, I remember if you, that. If you follow certain parameters right. in production, so no pesticides, solar panel, blah, blah, blah. You can have the this bee like on it. the back, <laughs> and and it's it's and it's a free thing, and it's an it's, associational consortium in Italy, and that's all that's all we need, you know. Then it's all about our bo our bottle of wine. Drink it. You will not get an eight H, you know. The sulfates is something that we need to have a little bit. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna drink our wines at home. You know, we're not gonna ship it to San Francisco, to exactly. Los Angeles. And, you know, and, this, and that's it's all about well. limits. Because yeah. when it comes into organic or biodynamic, and I see that you can add, I, I like to know the producer first, yeah. and then I will say, yeah, you you are organic. Because I see how you deal in your in your winery, how you deal in your vineyards. I think I don't want to see a certification. Too, I think you know? honest winemakers, honest wineries, and families, uh, less intervention, better expression of what we're trying to do and yes you're not going to throw away a crop right uh, you're going to put copper sulfate on there if uh in fact this is very interesting i'll tell you the story but you're going to do it because you're not going to let the thing mildew to death right so it's just going to happen right right so i mean these, i think this that's proper and the picture you see behind you is my father and i from my dad's store uh -huh. the, back then even california wines were very honest wines sure there wasn't a lot of stuff in it what's interesting what's fascinating to me is is that that the formula wines that are on the market now, and I talk about this all the time, uh, they've added sugar, they've added acid, they've done whatever they can to balance out what would, would have been bad grapes. And then all of a sudden now, they've created this monster, and then now some wineries are touting the fact that they're not that monster. Right. But they, but wineries from the 30s and 60s, like you guys, they didn't do it in the first place. These are modern techniques that these people are using to create these monsters, and to, to tout in a marketing way that you're, you're not that way is like saying, well, I'm, I'm as honest as I so, so should have been in the first place. Right. Um, but I was reading this other book and they were talking, you know, the Bordelais invented the uh, copper sulfate to help mm -hmm. prevent mildew. And during the war, there's no copper around <laughs> because the Germans had taken it all in sure. France. And so there was a, there was a couple of amazing stories of people stealing the copper away from the Germans and then 
going into these little labs and somewhere in the middle of the vineyard that the Nazis didn't know existed and making copper sulfate out of, their, out of the wow. copper that the Germans had kind of in the first place. But that's pretty damn natural. I mean, this is not made up stuff. We're not making the lab. We're taking real copper out of the ground and we're actually making something to protect the vines. And so I never understood why that's a big problem. Well, you again, know, so as a point of view. Yeah, to point POV, of view, right? Absolutely, point of view. So tell me before we get off because it's already fifty minutes. But this pencil, I, I, oh. most unique, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, packaging I've seen sure. is this tin pencil. Well, we got we got a few things in the winery um, that really we're, we we are well recognized about that. The first time we came in the United States was back in the two thousand and one. Uh, we used to be called Wine of the Roses. So if you look at the yeah, wine right. portfolio, we used to be the wine of the roses because we have more than five thousand uh, rose bushes in our in our in our uh, in our vineyards. So and we still have until two thousand fourteen. It was uh, this is, was an idea, a creative idea of my of my friend Vitaliano, so our our CEO. He came on one morning and said, "You know what? We got hundred and plus hectares of vineyards, beautiful, beautiful during the springtime, summertime." But come on, how about the fall? It's so gray and, you know, sad. We need some more color out there. Yeah. And I said, you know, let's put some nice sign, you know, next to the road. And I know I got, I got something something better. We need to patent it. And what? We need to replace all the, the poles. We, uh, we used to have some concrete poles, some old uh, wooden poles. And I said, okay, I bought more than 1,200 pencil poles in wood from Calabria, from the south. He yeah. said, what you did? <laughs> yeah, I bought 1,200 of he them. He didn't even ask, he just and did it. <laughs> they're coming, there's a truck coming soon, and we need to paint them. We have nine colors, our labels. We're going to paint them, all of them, and wow. we're going to replace uh, the so old So you're talking about a, a pole that's shaped, that's pointed the cone exactly, at the top. Exactly, like and uh, you wooden, paint. in wood, you know, pencil pole in wood. And this is the end of the row in the end of the road, well, at the beginning, the... at the end of the road, yeah. yeah, one of the rear, one of the one of the in the front. So you, when you come to visit us in the area, you can miss us, yeah, because you start to see three and a half miles of wow. pencil poles, you know, <laughs> and uh, and the rose and the bushes pictures, are still there, or not? The rose bushes are still there, and uh, sometimes you know we use them as a natural warning; they still do their job. Uh, but you know, ninety percent of the story, it's, warning it's, it's of, of course, is romance. You know, yeah, sometimes right. you have a disease and the rose is perfect. Yeah, right. But we still have a lot <laughs> of great roses, and uh, well, I got to tell you, you know, we got a lot of visitors coming, you know, to put their pictures on Instagram with our pencil poles all over the world, and and then it become you know a marketing tool. We are a very simple, very simple winery. We do a lot of uh, team work. You know, we're just fourteen in the wineries, included the the guys in wow. in the winery. So we came up with this, with this pencil uh, gift, let's say. That's so really fun. Pencil really fun. Pencil container. And, and then you come into, uh, there's a collection. The collection collectors are coming, you know, to get uh, the new edition of our pencil that is changing every year. So with simple thing, with wood, with just an aluminum, yeah. um, nice container. We just well, did our there's marketing. Another, there's another piece of that uh, that will wrap up with this, and that is, um, in America, there's a brand called uh, Barefoot, mm -hmm. and that's uh, a very s amazing story of a guy. I don't tell you, bore you with it, but um, he was told by a, 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 a purchasing agent, I'm talking about 1979 or ni no, 1986 or something like that. He was told by a purchasing agent of a large chain of pharmacies, actually, markets, mm. I want to be able to see that label that you put on this new brand from four feet away as I'm walking down the aisle. So if I'm somebody wow. looking for wine, I come to the wine section, I want to be able to point that out. Sure. And I think you've done that with a pencil well, <laughs> pencil shaped can. Our, our mentor, let's say, <laughs> our guru was in Piemonte, was Angelo Gaia. Yeah. Oh, With well, his okay. Barbaresco and yeah. Nebbiolos, you know, black and white. Yeah, that's could true. You point out the bottle from really, from 20 feet, from the bottom, you can say, hey, this is Angelo Gaia. So that's what we have been trying to do since Is there, is there camaraderie amongst the, the, Barber, the Barbera growers, the Osti people? Say is it again, there, I'm sorry. Is there camaraderie? Is there an open mm -hmm. dialogue between the winemakers of that area? Well, uh, or is there competition? <laughs> that's a good question. Well, we're not that good. We're not that good in cooperation. Like <laughs> the Italian you, race. No, I mean, the Italian, well, the French, the French, <laughs> they do better. Yes. Um, well, 
they hate each other, but at least publicly, you know, they do way better than us in terms of cooperation. Yeah, that's funny. well, we do, we do, but we always look at our garden. You yeah, know, that's right, the big sure. problem, and it's something that doesn't help, to yeah. be honest. And in a Barolo area, it worked well. You know, they did a great job. Uh, they fight it, <laughs> but in every yeah, big right. appellation, they fight it. In the Aztec district, we're still, you know, in different planets. Some producer are still working as a farmer. <laughs> Some others, they're acting like, uh, you know, a prima donna. Uh, we still have a long way. So to I go. think that the the wine industry in itself is oh, it's constantly that way. It is never going to change, really. No, so. it's you know, it's a big. We call it palcoscenico. It's a it's a big show, you yeah. know. Well, we're lucky to pass through, and I'm lucky uh, that you got to pass through Los Angeles to, for Trebek Yeri. It's and to, great we hope to be good here. luck tomorrow. Thank and you very much. The rest of your Paul. travels is a lot of work to do to do this, and standing at a booth for hours is not that easy. Yeah, to do, yeah, know. Yes. yeah. It's not a I great. <laughs> it's not a great deal, but yeah, we have to do it, and we are pleased to do it because we have people coming, you right. know, because they know we are here. So well, another two tomorrow. weeks to go. Cheers.